it's a difficult job for me because this is a subject on which I've never spoken at the level of school, uh, school kids. Uh, this is really meant to be for researchers primarily. And then in universities, it's a subject that is taught. It's called game theory. I thought it would be a good idea, since you are generally good students, to give you a flavor of this very exciting discipline called game theory. I will tell you a little bit of the history of the subject and then show you some first ideas of game theory which you should be able to follow. And since I have not ever lectured to game theory for an audience with no background in it, if I'm going too fast, if I'm not clear, stop me. Raise your hand and ask questions. How many of you have heard of a subject called game theory? You have not. So, some of the adults have, but yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, raise your hand. Yes. Okay. Okay. About 80%. That's very good. So, game theory is literally, I will tell you, it's the same theory used for analyzing games. How do you play chess? How do you play? How do you strategize in football? It's not about the shot of the football, but from which side you send the player. From which side you stand and protect your side. Bridge. The game of bridge. All these were being analyzed very early. Then, it's a very, actually it's a very adult subject I'm uh, uh, introducing you to. War. When you're, when you're in a war-like situation, it's a very similar reasoning you're doing. You don't fully know what the other side is planning, and you are planning what you can do to protect yourself and do better. That also comes under the discipline of game theory. Game theory has a very short history, but it has become a very important subject. So especially those of you who go into higher studies, if you especially go into masters, game theory uses a lot of mathematics. I will give you little flavors of that. But also, there are some philosophers who use a lot of game theory with no mathematics. Some of the most brilliant minds will give you insights into these kinds of interaction. There's a famous uh, Israeli economist, a Nobel Prize winner, Robert Auman. Uh, looks like an uh, ancient Indian sage with huge beard and all. He sits in Jerusalem. He's quite old now. He's been to India earlier. He used to travel around in India. He defines game theory as interactive rationality. What that means is normal rationality, rational behavior. You know the meaning of rational behavior? Thinking logically and deciding. If you're going out one day from home and you're wondering whether to carry your umbrella or not, you have to do a little bit of a rational calculation. We don't spend too much time on it. If it's completely clear sky, why carry the weight of the umbrella? You look at the sky. If it is raining, very easy. You will carry the umbrella. If it is looking cloudy, about to rain, you make a little calculation. Is it worth the hassle of carrying an umbrella? And you decide. It is worth it. It might rain. You take it. That's a rational decision you took about whether to carry an umbrella. When you're choosing your career, what do you want to be as an adult? Will you want to study law? Will you want to study engineering? Again, you will take a rational, you should take a rational decision. Think of what you enjoy. Think of practical things you have to think of. There should be the certain amount of money that you want to earn from that career. Is it worth the cost of the expenditure of that education? You do all that and you take a decision. That is rational behavior we talk about in economics, and a lot of economics is about this kind of rational behavior. But there's one difference with game theory. When you are going out and just thinking whether to carry your umbrella or not, you know that the probability of rain does not depend on your decision to carry an umbrella. I mean, if God was playing a game with you and watching and saying, oh, if you carry an umbrella, I won't give a rain. If you don't carry umbrella, I will put rain on you. Then that's a game. God is playing a game with you. But most of these decisions with nature 
are not a game. You take a decision because whoever is taking the decision whether to cause rain or not is not interacting with you. But in a, if you're playing game of chess, you know that the other person is also calculating. If I make this move, the other person will change the other person's plan. If I make the other move, the other person will change the plan. These kinds of interactions and how you analyze is what game theory is about. There is a very nice funny story which I like, which illustrates what game theory is about. There was a hat seller, you know a person who sells hats. He's got a whole bundle of hats and he's going from one village to another village to sell hats. While walking, he begins to feel very sleepy. So what he does is he puts all his hats down and under a tree he goes off to sleep. When he wakes up, he sees there's no hat anywhere. All the hats are gone. Where are the hats? He's a poor person. He sells hats and earns that that's his living. When he suddenly sees that on the treetop, monkeys have carried hats up and they are sitting with the hat, all the monkeys. What will he do? He's desperate. He needs those hats to sell. In his desperation, feeling sad, he takes his own hat and feeling angry, he throws it down on the ground. I think you know monkeys love to imitate. So when he throws his hat down, all the monkeys begin to throw their hats down. So he says, oh, big relief. He goes, collects all the hats, and goes off happily. 40 years have passed. His grandson has become a hat seller. He's going again from one village to another, when he begins to feel very sleepy. He puts all the hats down, goes off to sleep under a tree. When he wakes up, he sees all the hats are, there are no hats there. Where are the hats? Where are the hats? He suddenly sees on treetop, monkeys are sitting all with hats. So he said, what will I do? This is my livelihood. When he suddenly remembers his grandfather's story, his grandfather had told him, so he said, now I, my grandfather has told me, I will do the rational thing. He takes off his hat and throws it down on the ground. But no monkey throws their hats down. He's wondering what has happened. One monkey comes down, picks up the last hat on the ground, takes it under the arm, goes and gives him a slap, and says, you think only you have a grandfather? <laughs> so all the monkeys have learned. This is interactive rationality. The other side is also rational and calculating. And analyzing these is what game theory is all about. A little bit of the history of game theory. It is barely 100 years old. Actually, um, 2021, the Nobel Foundation did a huge celebration of 100 years of game theory. They treat one mathematician proving a theorem in mathematics in 1921 <coughs> as the start of game theory. But there were other things. You know, before that, a German mathematician called Zermelo In 1912, he proved something about the game of chess. I won't even tell you what it is. What happens, how you play chess, that was, many people treat that as a landmark paper, Zermelo's theorem on chess. Then, I'm just giving you the broad structures, very big breakthrough. As I said, 1921 is one breakthrough. Then there are two people. They were also involved in a lot of the research behind atom bombs. This is von Neumann and Morgenstern. I don't know if you've heard of von Neumann. He was like a genius. Von Neumann's work is 1944. Von Neumann does his classic work with Morgenstern. Then comes a very unusual person, John Nash. There is a film about John Nash. He was a genius, crazy genius. A lot of the geniuses are crazy. This is John Nash. John Nash basically worked in life for three, four years. Wrote four, five papers in pure mathematics, three, four papers in game theory, and did no further work. So it's a, but he's one of the greatest figures in the discipline. He's sort of fused off. So John Nash is 
work is between 19... 51 and 1954, uh, 53, and then John Nash's work stops. After that, there are actually prominent Indians. There is uh, my, one of my first students in Delhi School of Economics when I taught, Dilip Abru, important name, important papers. Avinash Dixit, important papers. One of the earliest papers using game theory and philosophy is Omortosen. And I will show you a little bit of Omortosen's early work, um, which became a very famous uh, paper published in the Philosophy Journal of Mind, where he was trying to explain some early philosophers using game theory. So, and there are other uh, prominent economists. In fact, I was very lucky. Three days ago, I was in, not three days, about seven days ago, I was in Ahmedabad with a very famous uh, game theorist, and he wanted to see that old town, so we were walking. He's roughly my age, Rubinstein. In fact, I have to bring him, he loves travel, going to different places, I have to bring him sometime to Para, Purulia, Rubinstein. These are people who are contributing to the discipline. Let me now give you an introduction to a particular game. And this game is probably the most famous game, I will actually write it up and describe. I'm thinking, well, let me start with that and then I want to do a little bit of parlor games as well. No, I will uh, do, start with a uh, parlor game, with a specific game which I want you to play with me, one of you, or two of you will play. I'll have to explain this game a little bit to you. This game is called the game of hex. Let me draw, I should have had this ready, but I have not, so I'll draw a simple hex board. A hex board looks like this. Hexagon, do you know this shape? This shape is called a hexagon. So I'll make a five hexagon. The board can be of any length, but I don't want to waste too much time on drawing and writing, so let me make it a five by five. We'll give you a reasonably interesting play of the game. Five. And I'll make it five. One, two, three, four. Uh. And now I'm regretting I made it five by five. I'm having to write too many. I'll write one more. I would have, should have made it four by four, but I'll finish it. One, two, three, four. It needs one more. <coughs> This game is called the game of hex, and I'll want you to play, so understand how this game is played. This game began in a very interesting way. In Princeton University, in the mathematics department, the floor tiles used to look like this, and John Nash used to play it on the bathroom floor, this game of hex, and there was also other people who have done it, but let me explain what the game is. You'll be able to play the game. Two of you are playing. So let me pick uh, who, one of you here and one of you here. Who wants to play the game? I'll explain. Let me explain the game. Then you'll see whether you enjoy the game or not. And, uh, and don't feel bad if you lose. I very often ask people to play with me and I end up losing. So it doesn't matter. That's what life is. Okay. Call this boundary the white boundary. This is the white boundary. This is the white boundary. Call this the black boundary and call this the black boundary. Just mentally keep this, this is white, white, black, black. There are stones, black stones and white stones. The first person has to pick up a white stone and you place a white stone anywhere. Then the second person player, there are two players there, picks up a stone and places a black stone anywhere. Then the first person picks up, places a white stone somewhere else. And like that, till the board fills up. What is the aim? The person putting white stones is trying to build a bridge from this boundary to the this boundary, the white to white. White, 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 white. 
then the white person has won. And the black person playing black is trying to build a bridge from this wall to that wall. If that person can do, if that person manages this, well, you don't even have to come here. If you do this, can you see black has won? Can you see one thing? In this game, it's impossible for both black and white to win. When you fill it up, if there is one wall built from the top to the bottom, then it's impossible for black to go from left to right. Can you see that? Otherwise, stop and ask me. OK. Now, I just want you to play this game. So one of you will play white. So you're trying to put stones from this boundary. You don't have to start here. You can start anywhere. But your aim is to this to this a uh, wall. And black is trying to go from here to here, a wall. Whoever builds, wins. So I want one of you, one each, to play. OK, come. OK. So I know your name. Anushi. Yes. Yeah. Anushi. And what's your name? Should be. Very good. So you take one. Uh, do you have a preference for white or black? White. White? OK. Then white moves first. So remember again, everyone, because she's trying to build a wall of white, 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 white there. And he's trying to build anywhere, anywhere from this to this. So it could be like this. OK, go ahead. Move white. You just write W wherever you want to move. OK. Think a bit, because you have to block the other person also, if the other person is going fast. OK, go ahead. You write the B a bit brighter, so we can see it clearly. Make it a sharp B, my eyes are, yes, perfect. I, 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 I stop for a minute, Anushi. Let, here, I think you reasoned correct. I could see that. See, the reasoning she went through probably, this wall, it's a lost case for you. You can't block him from reaching this wall because if she takes this, he'll take this. If she takes this, he'll take this. So this frontier, give up. Don't even try to block him there. Now it's your move. So they think very hard. Do you see the same logic should apply for him? Yes. Very good. Perfect. Think hard. Uh, don't rush. Very good thinking. OK. Now. Perfect thinking. You, there's nothing you can do. Can you see that? To be able to see that, she has now got two closures here, two closures here. So wherever he blocks, she'll take the other one there. Wherever he blocks, she'll take the other one. May as well finish it. If you take B here, she's going to take that. Can you all see that? So she's won it, this game. And you, ca you can keep playing this. It's great fun. You can make it six by six, seven by seven, etc. But I'm very pleased. I'll tell you a theorem where she does have an advantage which was not known for a long time. White has a logic in these games. This was a very famous theorem proved by Nash. White does have an advantage. Uh, so uh, if both are perfect machines, computers playing white will always, the first mover will always win. There is a theorem on that. I'm just thinking whether I'll try to prove the theorem to you. I can give a proof. It's a slightly abstract proof or whether I should not waste time on it. Proof the both. Let me give the proof. So thank you. Sit down, both of you. I'm actually very pleased. They're not the winner or the loser. I could see both of them are thinking perfectly logically. So you can leave it like that. Yeah, don't worry. Uh, well, I will again fill up one or two just now when I'm giving a proof. Now, this game, usually it's played on a 14 by 14 board, but it can be played on any boards. One of the early theorems. This was John Nash, and very interestingly, two people proved this theorem. There was a poet, someone who used to write poetry, called Piet Hein, who in Denmark, Copenhagen, the poet gave a proof, and John Nash gave a proof. The proof is there is a result, saying, if these are perfect machines, 
white can always win. The first mover can always win. In fact, there is a theorem about chess also. Chess is a very boring game. If it's perfect machines playing, one side will always win. In fact, in chess, we don't know which side, but it will be the same result every time. That is known. That was the famous German mathematician's theorem. That if it's machines playing chess, it will be the same result every time. This is Zermelo's theorem, but it's very complicated. I won't even go into that. I just realized it's a daring thing. We are doing this with Ramanujan staring at us from behind. Well, it's a frightening, frightening thought. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to show you this. I want to see whether you'll follow. It's a, no mathematics needed, but it's a very strange abstract proof that the person who moves first can always win. And this is a very strange theorem because we don't know how that person can win. We just know that person can win. Do you get it? That if it's a perfect machine, the white can always win. Though no one knows quite what the right strategy is, especially if the board is big. The proof goes like this. Stop me. If it's too abstract, we'll get. There are other things I want to do which are interesting. Suppose black can always win. Suppose, assume. Have you all ever done? I don't know whether you've started doing in mathematics occasionally in geometry also. We begin with the opposite assumption, reach a contradiction. Okay, so you've done that. If you reach a contradiction, you know that that was wrong. So begin by saying that black can always win. Okay, what does that mean? That means black can write down a book which gives perfect instruction. In principle, you can write down a book with the instructions of how to play. Like the book will say, how to make the perfect second move. Black makes the, remember, black does not make the first move. First move is white. So the book will say, if white places it here, place black here. If white places it here, place black here. So it gives you, the book will have an instruction on how to make the perfect second move. It's a book for black to win. Then white makes the third move. Then the book will also tell you how to make the perfect fourth move. Because it's black's book. So how to make the perfect second move, fourth move, sixth move, etc. So black, let us pretend black writes down such a book. How to play this game perfectly. Let white now do something. Make a photocopy of Black's book and decide, I'm going to use this book to win this game. White has got Black's book and is about to make the first move. There's one problem in using this book to decide how to make the first move. Can you see that? Black's book on how to win, White is planning to cheat with that book, is looking up how to make the first move. The book will not tell you anything. The book does not tell you how to make the first move. The book only tells you how to make the second move, fourth move. So first move, there is no instruction. What will white do? Let's say white places a stone, white stone anywhere, but mentally calls this a gray stone. Nothing from the book. You just place it anywhere, call this a gray stone. Mentally, black makes the first move. Black makes the next move. White now uses this book's instruction on how to win, pretending that this is the first move. This does not exist. So in, in that case, if it was the case, this did not exist, this is the first move, the book tells you how to make the perfect next move. So you can use it. White uses the book, pretends this is the first, and places a white stone there. Do you get it? You pretend this does not exist. Black makes another move. You pretend that this does not exist. First, second, third, how to make the best fourth move, you are again checking up. And the book gives you an instruction. You follow that. You keep doing that. There's one instruction which can cause you a problem because you are pretending, one thing that is not true, you are pretending that this does not exist. If the book says, place a stone over there, then you are in a bit of a trouble. Do you see that? But actually, it's not a big trouble. Because you anyway have a stone there. You mentally switch the stone over to the white stone. Call it white. And put another stone anywhere and call it gray. So the theorem goes that if black can win this game, 
White can use that book to also win the game. Two people winning the game is impossible. You can't have a boundary from top to bottom and side to side. Therefore, it's impossible to write a book which tells you how to win for black. That's the proof. This is, uh, so I, I actually I think from the nods you're, you're getting the gist of this, that's it. So game theory is full of these kinds of abstract things. And if you get interested, there are many more little examples that are actually simpler examples, which I remember with my daughter, I had developed it for classroom when my daughter was in high school, a bit senior to you all in class 11, 12, and then I use it in my uh, undergraduate lectures. But I will not do that because right now, I'll depend, it'll depend a bit on time. I want to, to take you into more real life-ish, real life type situations to use game theory. It's the same theory used here, used in war. You know, one of the most dangerous moments for human beings was, it's called the Cuban Missile Crisis. Have you heard of the Cuban Missile Crisis? Any of you? No. It was between uh, United States and Russia after both of them had developed nuclear weapons in 1962 they came very close to a nuclear exchange. And you know, a nuclear exchange means it's basically devastation for the world if the two big powers get in. Um, uh, about nine, 10 months before this war situation developed, President Kennedy, and this, he gets respect for this, he had commissioned a paper by someone called Thomas Schelling on just using game theoretic reasoning in war-like situations. And Thomas Schelling, later on, he earned the Nobel Prize. Thomas Schelling is an amazing person. He doesn't do any mathematics. For him, it's all just reasoning, plain English language. I mean, you will follow if you read Schelling's work. So game theoretic reasoning was used in this war-like situation. Depending on time, I'll give you a glimpse of that. But let me take you into probably the most famous simple game theoretic story, which is there in Sen's early papers, where he is explaining some early philosophical writings using game theory. This is a game, this is a simple game, but very important game, and I want everyone to understand that. Okay, I don't need this anymore. This is a game called The Prisoner's Dilemma. Among games, probably it's the best known, it also shows that selfishness in many situations can turn out to be very bad for you. When you're perfectly selfish, you can do perfect harm to yourself. But you know, life is complicated. Occasionally, selfishness does help. It's best not to be selfish, whether it helps or not. But this is a game which is going to give you an illustration which became very famous. It was very important for economists because many economics textbooks will tell you, let every individual be selfish, doing well for himself or herself. Society will continue. Prisoner's dilemma shows at times, if people are selfish, it can backfire in a very big way. And how many of you have, you have heard of the term prisoner's dilemma? So, do you know the game already? Uh, how many of you don't know the game prisoner's dilemma? Okay, so I'll do it. So for some of you, it will be a repetition. For others, it will be new, but it will give me a segue into other kinds of games. The prisoner's dilemma began with a story. Actually, how the prisoner's dilemma began is also a very interesting story. Prisoner's dilemma as a game had been discovered in 1950 uh, uh, by some uh, people working in RAND corporations. They were not university professors, some researchers in RAND corporation. A very famous mathematician called Tucker uh, do, in school, I don't know if you do the Kuhn-Tucker condition for optimization, but Tucker was a mathematician in Princeton. Tucker went as visiting professor to Stanford. This was in 1953 or 4. The main prisoner's dilemma, this is how it happened. Tucker went to Stanford to visit the mathematics department, and it's good to know America messes up office space situation very often. He reached Stanford's mathematics department. They discovered they had not kept an office room for Tucker. So where will they put Tucker? They phoned the psychology department. 
there was an office there. So Tucker had his office in the psychology department while teaching in the mathematics uh, department in um, Stanford. Like many mathematicians, Taka's work was door would be wide open. All he needed was a so white sheets of paper and pencil and pen. All day he would sit and he'll be scribbling away. He's a mathematician. The psychology professors would see him, the strange person sitting and just scribbling. One day the head of the department of psychology came in and said, Professor Taka, we are very curious. What is it that you do all day? Uh, just sitting and writing on paper. Can you give a lecture to us psychologists about what you do? So Tucker said, sure, I will be happy to talk. And then Tucker thought that to psychologists, I'll have to explain to them what I'm doing with a story. And the story that he developed is called The Prisoner's Dilemma. For that lecture to psychologists, became very famous. The story is the following. I want you to follow the story because then we'll, we'll be solving it just now. Two persons have been caught for some petty crime. Let me get two names. What's your name? Shomojit. 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 Ariba. Ariba. Shomojit and Ariba. Uh, good. A, I need one player to be A, other B would be perfect, but S I'll manage A and uh, Ariba and Shomojit. Two of you have been arrested. Don't feel bad. The, there's a charge against you that you've done something wrong, some criminal charge. Now, the judge says that we don't, I don't have enough evidence. He hears everything, says I can't make out. It's a very confusing situation. So I will punish you by the following judgment. The judge gives a very strange judgment. Ariba, you sit separately on a No, not really. The judge says you sit uh, on a chair. And Shomajit, you go and sit on the chair. You don't have to do that. Sit separately. Don't talk to each other. On a piece of paper, write down. I confess I have done it or I have not done it. On a piece of paper, you write down. I have done it, you don't actually have to do. This is what the judge tells the two of them to do. I have done it, I have not done it. I have, it's up to you. And this is the way I'm going to punish, the judge says. Since I have no evidence, if both of you say you have done it, then you have almost certainly done it. So I'm going to put you in jail for 10 years each in jail. You both said you've done it. If both of you say, we have, I have not done it, this is a crime which the I as a judge, I know it's either jointly done or the crime had not happened. If both of you say, I have not done it, I have not done it, then both of you are saying you have not done it. But there is a little bit of evidence, I'll put you behind bars for two years in jail. It's a very uh, harsh judge. So you both said you haven't done it, two years in jail. Okay, now, if one person says we did it, other person says we did not do it. Because it's a joint crime. About that, there's no question. So I was involved, I was not involved. This is the way I'm going to give the punishment. The person who says I did not do it, the secret is out. The other person has said we've done it. Then you've done it and you're a liar, 20 years in jail. It's a crazy judge, but that should not bother you. And the other person, has done it and is so honest, is saying I've done it, zero years in jail, you'll go free. It's a crazy sentence that you don't worry about. The question here is, given this sentence that the judge has given, what will Ariba do as a rational person? And the rational person here means you want to stay in jail as little as possible. You want to minimize jail stay. And Shomojit, what will you do if you're rational? That's the question. They don't have to answer. I want the whole class to be involved in answering. Before you answer, you write down the prisoner's dilemma, and some of the earliest discussions of prisoner's dilemma, the best ones are by both Amartya Sen was my PhD advisor. Some of his earlier, Amartya Sen is not, he did some of the earliest works in game theory, but he's not treated as a central figure in game theory. But his discussion of the prisoner's dilemma and one more game was one of the earliest small pieces of game theory that I'm introducing you to. So, before you write down what you should do, both of you, um, uh, Ariba and Shomujit, and this game is being played, pretend by all of you, write down the sentence clearly so that you can analyze it, and that's what I will do. This is what the sentence is. This is the prisoner's dilemma being described. <coughs> so, this is, let me say, this is uh, player, let me make it player 
one and player two. Player one is Ariba Shomoji. But I'll keep it neutral. Any of you can think of this game being played. Player one and two. Player one can say, confess, not confess. And the meaning of this, I'm writing this very short, cryptically, but what it means is, I've done it. I have not done it. And in this case, the crime we do know is either jointly committed or not committed. So we did it, we did not do it. Confess, not confess. And Shomajit can all, will ha also have to write down, either write down confess or write down not confess. Did not do it. And this is a standard thing in game theory. We write it like this. And you write down what the two individuals will get inside these boxes. This has a name. It's called the payoff matrix. A payoff matrix has all the numbers, which tells you what the game is fully. Now, write, tell me, if both of you confess, do you remember how much you get? 10. So what we write is 10, 10. The left hand number is always what this person gets. The right hand number in any box is what this person gets. 10, 10. If both don't confess, haven't done it. Two. Player one says, I, I have not done it. Player two says, we have done it. How much will player one get? 20 years in jail. And player two will get? Zero. Very good. And this one, who, how much here? Zero and 20. This is a reversal of this. OK, you people think faster than me. I take very long to think. So very good. I, 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 I trip up on these things. That's the payoff matrix. Now, if you are just selfish, not thinking of the other person at all, and in a situation like jail, we would, most of us would tend to be, I just want to get out as much, quickly as possible. What will you do? How will two rational players choose what to do? Put yourself in the shoes of this. Imagine you're one of them and think very hard and tell me, will you confess or not confess? I just want to hear your reactions. Yes. You will not confess. Uh, why? Can you give me a little bit of reason? You'll get you'll get so what he's saying is he'll choose not confess because if the other person also chooses not confess you're going to get away with two years each but think a bit hard suppose you're this person you've chosen not confess other person has chosen not confess if the other person is choosing not confess is this the rational thing for you to do if the other person is choosing not confess, you are stuck on this column. Then what is the better thing for you to do? Not confess or confess? confess? Confess. Do you see, if the other person is not confess, is not confessing, you should confess, you'll get away with zero. Awful thing to do, to let down the other person. But if you are just trying to do well for yourself, if the other person is not confessing, you know you are stuck on this column. This column is gone. You are on this column. If you're on this column, your choice is between not confess two years, confess zero years, you should confess if your aim is to minimize jail stay. So if the other person does not confess, you'll do that. So think again now, what would you do? Yeah. You're not worried about the other person, but you want to minimize yours. So you're saying you will, no matter what the other person does, you will confess. What's your name? Amira. 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 Perfect answer. So let me explain this. What she said, and all of you should be able to see. See, if the other person has chosen not confess, we just saw. You should confess, pick up zero instead of two. If the other person has chosen confess, you're stuck on this column. You can't go there. You're stuck on this. What will you do? What you do? You'll confess. So you've reached a very strange conclusion. No matter what the other person does, you are always better off by not confessing, by confessing. 
no matter what the other person does. Therefore, in fact, very often we colloquially say, prisoner's dilemma is not a dilemma. You don't have to think very hard what you should do, because no matter what the other person does, you're better off by confessing. But if both of you confess, the game will end up here. You will spend 10 years each in jail, and as you are rightly saying, you could have got away with two years, but that does not happen. But this is a trap. If you are perfectly rational just thinking about yourself, you will end up at confess, confess, 10, 10. And there is a name for this outcome. It's called the Nash equilibrium. This is what John Nash's famous work is. You'll be trapped in the bad equilibrium with perfect calculation, each trying to do as well as possible, but collectively you're caught in a trap. The prisoner's dilemma became a very, very famous game because it's almost an illustration how two perfect machines doing calculations right end up doing miserably for themselves compared to what they could have done. This is a very big problem. We, in fact, in a lot of um, climate change is issues, this comes up. What is good for each person thinking, I mean, you can litter the street, spoil it, it's easy for you. You chuck something and go, it's better for you. But if everybody does it, you collectively end up in the bad outcome. This game became a very, very famous game, uh, The Prisoner's Dilemma. You will encounter it everywhere. And it has important lessons also that ruthless selfishness can be very bad for a collectivity. However, if the other person is selfish, there's nothing, even if the other person is not selfish, short of a moral hardwiring that, look, I will never do the, uh, let down the other person, something like that, you can't get to the good outcome. Because it's worthwhile for me to deviate, worthwhile for the other person to deviate. You will get away. This is the only equilibrium formally in a game like this. Let me, Kirom, um, uh, time. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, let me uh, take, uh, introduce you to another game, which is a game that I had uh, created. Uh, the game has become quite well known. There have been laboratory tests done with this game. Uh, it's a sort of extension of this game. Let me explain this game. Um, uh, I, I published it in 1998, but there are now many uh, lab tests done, so I know how people play this game. It's an easy enough game. Let me try to explain, because I had done the game with a uh, story. I had explained it. Let me, yeah. I have a question. Sure. Like you said, if the both A and B knows each other, what they will do? So both can now not confess and get the lowest one. So what is the percentage that this will work? See, if you know the other person is doing this, not confessing, but if you are perfectly selfish, what will you do? You, so then, not confess with perfectly selfish players, this will not stick. Again, you'll deviate. And the other person will deviate. You'll end up here. That is the trouble. Of course, what is troubling you is, you, both of you want to be there. But you can't be there if you're perfectly selfish. You have to be prepared to make personal sacrifice to be at this good outcome. So though uh, Prisoner's Dilemma was treated as, I'm glad you're asking this, it was treated as a pure mathematical exercise, few numbers. It's become socially very important for climate change discussions, for a variety of things we say. If all of us live by only our self-interest, we, we will in fact not serve our self-interest. That's what you're saying, we will end up doing badly. And that's what it lasts. Uh, no, so no, but please do. Uh, over here, we don't know whether the, uh, okay, we don't know whether the crime was committed or not. Yeah, so that's not. Uh, I had that dilemma. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. If I'm confessing, I'm confessing my crime, so I'm an honest yeah. person. So I can be selfish and honest yeah. at the same time. Yeah, that so can which be. Which are contradictory yeah. qualities. Agree. But you know, the way the prisoner's dilemma is done, or giving all this story to it, confession, not confession, brings in honesty and such matters. Yes. We want to stay away from that. So okay. the way it is done typically is. Two actions you have, A or B. A or B. You don't even know what they mean. You have to choose, say, A or B. If both of you choose B, you'll get two years each in jail. If both of you choose A, you'll get 10 years each in jail. Exactly the same with A and That's the way it is done. So there should not be the additional baggage of honesty and all. Because of the story, all that begins to come, but we tend to do without that. 
In fact, the way I will tell you the next story, which is a game, which is the game that I have developed. That also has a story which is slightly troubling, and people get into that. But the story behind it is not important. I wrote, give the story so that people can follow. It's called the traveler's dilemma. The tra traveler's dilemma is the following case. Actually, before I do the traveler's dilemma, I'm going to give you a, have I, I've probably done it in your school when I lectured earlier. Uh, yeah, I have, but I'm going to do this a different class I'll do. There is a very important philosophical paradox. A paradox, you know, is where logic takes you to a conclusion that seems wrong. I want to introduce this philosophical paradox because the traveler's dilemma uses that paradox. But the paradox is an important contribution to philosophy. It was published in 1948 in the journal Mind. And again, there must be 200 papers. At Cornell, there are computer scientists doing very heavy mathematical work trying to understand this paradox. But the paradox is a very simple one. It's called the surprise test paradox. Are there people who know about it? Surprise test paradox. OK, this is the story. Um, a teacher uh, comes into your class. So Priyanka comes in and tells you that students, uh, next week, I'm going to give you a surprise test. You'll suddenly get it, and you'll have to do it. So the school next week, meaning Monday to Friday, will be the surprise test, and I'll see how you're doing. And she goes away. The weekend comes, Saturday, Sunday, the students are feeling very bad. What's the meaning of surprise test that you won't know in advance that it's going to happen that day? All, of, all the students are feeling very depressed. Surprise tests are awful. You suddenly get the test. But then one clever student begins to think, let me reason a little bit which day would Priyanka ma'am, I don't know what you call her, Priyanka ma'am, uh, is going to uh, uh, give us the test. And you reach a very interesting conclusion. There's one day of the week where a surprise test can never be scheduled for that day because you'll get to know the previous day. Which day is it? Friday. Friday. Who said that? Yeah. If the test is on Friday, you will know on Thursday. The test is tomorrow. So very interesting conclusion you've reached. A surprise test can never, if you're told that it's next week, it can never be on Friday. So the student is now feeling good. Well, at least I know that it's either Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then it strikes an interesting thought. Can the surprise test be scheduled for Thursday? You know it can't be on Friday, but can it be scheduled for Thursday? <coughs> no, why not? Sir, because we already know that uh, it cannot be on Friday, so on Wednesday we know that it is on Friday. Actually, exactly right reason. So, on, if it is on Thursday, you've already by logic ruled out Friday, so then on Wednesday evening, you will know it's coming tomorrow. Because you, by logic, you've ruled out Friday. It can't be on Friday. When this evening, you see it hasn't happened now, so it's tomorrow, Thursday. But as soon as it happens that by Wednesday, you know it's on Thursday, it can't be on Thursday. <laughs> so surprise tests can never be held on Friday nor on Thursday. The student is now thinking, so can it be on Wednesday? And reaches a troubling conclusion. What conclusion is that? Can you see? Can you see that? By the same logic. If it is planned for Wednesday, already you've seen it can't be on Friday, it can't be on Thursday. If it is on Wednesday, you'll know on Tuesday. So it can't be a surprise test on Wednesday. When surprise tests cannot happen on Earth on Friday, on Thursday, on Wednesday, and probably you can see the logic now. It can't happen on Tuesday because you will know it can't happen on Monday. There cannot be any surprise test on Earth is the conclusion. <laughs> Something wrong with this. But this is actually a devastating problem. What is wrong with this logic is very, very difficult to understand. And there are at least 200 papers, philosophers, mathematicians, game theorists, um, uh, computer scientists. Now, I, at Cornell, I've got someone called Joe Halpern who's got papers on this, on computer scientists, trying to see what is wrong in the logic. Surprise tests do happen. People get surprised. But the logic says it can't happen. This is called a paradox. And I love paradoxes, so I spend a lot of my time on different paradoxes. The game that I created, Traveler's Dilemma, 
uses a little bit of that logic. And this game also has caught on, maybe because it's a troubling game, and it's a generalization of the prisoner's dilemma. Easy enough that I'll be able to explain to you. Let me now explain. Put the uh, uh, prisoner's dilemma surprise test out of your head. Treat this as a pure problem. Two of you. What's your name? Sir, Alonika. Alonika. And what's your name? Sir, Shobhik. Shobhik. Alonika and Shobhik. Oh, AMS, AMS. A, OK, same. Alonika and Shobhik. You've gone. You don't know each other. You've gone to a remote island, Pacific island, for a vacation. You've bought a little, some uh, village craft, identical. Uh, some village craft she's bought, and some village craft you've bought. And you've come back to Kolkata airport. Netaji Shubhashpur airport, you've come down, your airline brought you, and you get the thing, and you see that the airline had damaged it. They kept it very badly, and you see the airline has damaged it. Both of you don't know each other, you've got this, you make a bit of a fuss that, look, the airline should have taken care of this. I don't go to Pacific Islands every day, they've spoiled this. When the manager comes out, the airline manager and says, we can see we've damaged it and I'm going to give you a compensation. And this is how I'm, I had no idea what this strange object spices, so this is how I'm going to compensate you. Both of you sit on two separate chairs, don't talk to each other. Write down the price of this object, which can be anything from two to a hundred. When I wrote the paper, I wrote it in dollars. You can think of dollars because two rupees for Pacific Island object sounds too cheap. So two dollars to hundred dollars is what you had spent. And uh, 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 no, the manager says, I don't know how much it is, but anything from two to hundred you can write down. Only integers, you know, integers, you can write fractions. You can write two, three, up to hundred. And this is how I'm going to compensate you since I don't know the actual price. If both of you write the same number, I will assume that you're speaking the truth. I'll give you that number in money. So if both of you write 50, $50 each compensation. If you write different numbers, this is how I'm reasoning. My reasoning is not important. What I'll do is I'm telling you. If you write different numbers, I'll treat the lower number as the honest price. So I basically want to give both of you the lower number, but with one penalty and reward. The person who wrote the lower number is so good in comparison to the other person that that person will get the lower number plus two dollars. And the person who wrote the higher number will get the lower number minus two dollars. So the, this is the payment system for your reward. Now you're sitting, the, you've got actually, the, I'll show you just now. The payoff, I could have written a matrix from two to 100, two to 100, and all the payoffs, but of course that will crowd up the space, but it's very easy to see. If both of you write 49, for instance, how much will you get? $49 each. If one writes 49 and the other writes 100, the one who wrote 49 will get? And the one who wrote 100? 47. Okay, so that's it. Now, you're both perfectly rational creatures. You don't know the other person, and you're not trying to tell the truth. So no matter what you've spent, you're just trying to make as much possible from the airline. That's your aim. What is the rational thing to do? That's what you're thinking. And let me show you the uh, logic of this. We will be done in another five, five minutes, ten minutes maybe. Let me show you the logic of this. If both of you choose um, 100, you're first sitting and thinking. If I choose 100, that person chooses 100, good, we will get $100 each. But then it should strike you that if the other person is choosing 100, I can do a little bit better. By doing what? 99. She'll say, ah, I can do a bit better by writing 99, I'll get 101. And if you're perfectly selfish and mean, you'll say, good, I don't care about that person, I'll write 99. So she's about to write 99, when it suddenly strikes, she's looking at him, he looks quite intelligent. By now he's figured out the same logic, he's going to write 99. If both of us write 99, of course I won't get 100 around, I'll get $99. So I'm feeling reconciled when it will suddenly strike her, she can do a little better. If 98. If she writes 98, she'll get 100. With the other person writing 99, she'll go, God, I can get back to 100. By writing 98, looks at him and says, that person is clearly thinking along my lines, intelligent person. By now, that person is down to 98. 
So if that person is writing 98, what will I do? 97. Can you see it's the logic of the uh, 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 surprise test paradox? This game, the traveler's dilemma, has only one equilibrium. Both of you will write two. And you'll get two dollars each. Can I write $1? You're not allowed to write. I just made it from two to uh, two to a hundred. If I had made it one to hundred, you would both write. It's the lowest one that you would go to. I made it two to hundred because I didn't want negative payoffs. Two to hundred keeps all the payoffs as uh, in positive payoffs. So two is where you stop. And that's the only stopping place. And this game can be analyzed in many different ways. The Nash equilibrium and other things all will take you to the outcome of 2-2. Two, two. It's again a very troubling result. We can see there's something wrong with this logic. But what is wrong is not clear. It's a perfect reasoning. 100, 100, I'll go to 99, 99, I'll go to 98. 2-2 two, two is the stopping point. This game has led to a lot of two different kinds of things. One is, of course, there are easy answers. We are not perfectly selfish. That's the easy answer. And if you make people play this in laboratories, we've done lots of experiments have taken place. In labs, people tend to choose 90 to 100. Most people go 90 to 100. Cluster of number 96, 97, 98 standard answers. Few people choose two. And my view is the people who choose two is trying to show that I know game theory. Is not giving an honest answer, but that game theory predicts two. Uh, and so one is just by saying human beings have a minimal amount of concern for the other person. That's fine, we know that. But the logic of this is also problematic. Even if you did not, will you be that foolish and go to 2-2? Two, two? Lot of analysis, lot of trying to understand this, that is there. There are many other games and you know, taking it to uh, a real life context, there's something called, maybe I'll show you one more game. Uh, toward the next class, out of five minutes, Branka. I don't want, to. okay. So now, so let me show you one more. So you've learned the sort of important games. This is called, this was actually the first person who did it was Omorto Sen. He called it the assurance game. The game has become very famous now. It's called the coordination game because it shows another principle it illustrates. This was Omurtu Sen's name, but it's better known now as the coordination game. Let me now make this game with pure abstractly. Uh, two of you are playing this game. What's your name? Oh, oh, no. oh no, I met you earlier. Shujoy. Oh, yeah, this is perfectly simple. I did your planet. Oh, is it? Oh, no, it can't be organized that way. The class A is sitting here. What a coincidence. A and S. So A and S and one N. One N and one P. Rest are A and S. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. So you have to cho choose two actions. Let me call these actions. Just uh, completely no story to it. C and D. Player one. Ohana, you have to choose between C and D, and you have to choose between C and D, player two. No, uh, 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 yeah, I, 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 if you do, then what will happen is what I'm going to tell you. Yeah, after I've written down the payoff, you make your choices, yeah. Let us say this is, uh, you will get 100 rupees each, 100 rupees each, you'll get 80 each, 80 each, and you will get, no, let me make it a bit less, 50, 50, and you get 0, 0, 0, 0. This game has the following. I'll, I'll just directly tell you this. If you think the other person is playing D, you are this player. If the other person is playing D, you're stuck on this, what will you choose? If the other person is playing D, will you play C or D? You will play D. If the other person is playing C, you're on this column. You can choose C or D, what will you choose? C. C. So this game has two equilibriums, or two equilibria. If both of you are mentally thinking the other person will choose D, it is best for you to choose D. 
this is one equilibrium. If both of you think the other person is going to choose C, you will both choose C. This is the other equilibrium. I could make this payoff even less. Ten and these are zero, so it, the equilibrium remains the same. If the other person chooses D, you'll choose D. If the other person chooses C, you'll choose C. This game has two equilibria, and societies at times get caught in the bad equilibrium. When there are many people, if you think everyone is choosing D, you'll say, what? I have no choice in the matter. I can't deviate alone. I will also choose D. If a society can be caught in the good equilibrium, so this is called the coordination game. Here, what you want is society to coordinate and get onto the better equilibrium in case you are caught in a trap of this bad equilibrium. Omurto Sen called this the assurance game, meaning if you're caught in this trap, everyone chooses D, you say it's miserable. We could have all been better off and no, you don't have to be kind to others. If all choose C, it's in your interest to choose C. But this is a trap. You need the assurance to move to the better equilibrium. This, Omurto Sen used it to describe some work of Rousseau, the philosopher. He wanted to give Rousseau's work a slightly formal description and gave rise to this game, which is called the assurance uh, game or the coordination game. Lots of writings on this, yes. Uh, my question is that why would anyone choose C? Uh, why would anyone choose D? Because, if, because uh, everyone chooses C is their maximum, but let us suppose this is a society with a million people and they've got into the habit of choosing D. Everyone chooses D. What will you do as an individual if everyone's in the habit of D? So the thing is, what you're saying is right, that it's an irrational, collectively irrational thing to do. But societies often get trapped in bad habits and practices. I feel a lot of basic honesty. If a society gets trapped in a behavior where everyone cheats, then you say, I have no choice. I'm also cheating. It's collectively very bad. But you're caught in this bad equilibrium. That was the idea that societies at times get caught where no one wants to be there. And over here, what you're pointing out is right. Once you get into this better outcome, you don't need police. It's in your interest to do that, and everyone's doing that. But societies get caught in these bad equilibria. So a lot of international negotiations, when you feel the whole world is being irrational, I feel a lot of the warlike behavior, where you build up huge amounts of ammunition to fight the other side, is getting caught in this. In the end, no one is benefiting by this warlike situation. If you could have a treaty and break out of that and get into a better outcome, you would all be better off. So this game is used a lot in negotiation discussions that look, we are all collectively caught in a bad outcome. But we want to get out of this. And the world today, I began with this, I'll just end by saying that, you know, 1962, when that Cuban missile crisis happened, that was analyzed by using another game, which is called the Hawk-Dove game. The Hawk-Dove game became even more famous because later on, a biologist, John Maynard, Smith, who had actually come and worked in Calcutta, met Poshanto Mohalan Nobis, he started, there's a discipline called game theory and evolutionary analysis. For evolution and game theory analysis, this biologist used the game called the hawk Tough game. The hawk Tough game is used to analyze warlike situations. <laughs> what should you do? And we know that the chilling uh, incident of 1960, uh, 1962, I'll just give you the description of what had happened. Uh, President Kennedy um, was woken up on the six, 16th of October in the morning. His advisor came into his room and said, President Kennedy, we have just discovered that the Russians had broken one part of our treaty and they have placed nuclear weapons in Cuba. From Cuba, for nuclear weapons to hit uh, uh, United States would take eight minutes. So Russia can very quickly attack the U.S., uh, oh, 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 in an eight minute time. So Kennedy called his advisors and had a discussion in the Oval Office and this discussion was recorded for 13 days. This was a secret recording. Uh, President Kennedy of course knew, but others did not know that everyone coming into that room, they were being recorded the discussion. 
That book is wonderful to read. It's a chilling book, real life. Th people, about 15 of them, discussing how to handle. For the first five, six days, it was a complete secret. No one knew that Kennedy knew. What should Kennedy do? And it's worth reading because it's a, it's a more adult book because it's a dangerous time for the world. There were some generals advising Kennedy that Russians don't know that we know. So just go and bomb out uh, Cuba. Occasionally, Kennedy is saying, you know, you want to win the war, but you also have to think of the cost you're inflicting on another country. Kennedy comes out, I have to say, out of this very good compared to what many of the generals were saying. So this discussion goes on, and we know now what happened. On uh, Five days after that, Kennedy made a public announcement, making a very aggressive move, but no war, just telling the Russians, you have to clear out Cuba of these, otherwise we will attack you. So gave a threat in advance. And the hawk dove game is a game where the first mover, the person who makes the first move, has an advantage. And a lot of warlike situations, you use the hawk dove game to analyze. So this game theory is something which from parlor games to business enterprises fighting with one another to diplomacy and war, it's used all over as a sort of underlying structure of thinking, how do you think rationally? But before I go, I just want to tell you, I keep telling my class at Cornell, at one level, it's a very neutral discipline. It's not telling you what is good, what is bad, but whatever it is you try to do, how do you do well? But in life, it's very important to remember that we must have some moral hinges. It's not just maximizing numbers that we are doing. Some moral principles you want to live by. So those must not be abandoned. You want to understand with total clarity. But you have to hardwire your thinking with that there are certain moral principles by, by which I will live. And moral principles, really, I'm not referring to religious principles going to heaven, but basic honesty, basic kindness, which is common to religious, non-religious beliefs. These are our morals. So game theory is a hard-headed analysis. Go into this, but don't abandon the morals by which we ought to live life. Let me stop with that. And yeah, I don't know if you all have any questions. I, mean, I spoke continuously, but feel free to ask. Just anything, actually. Let's keep a little bit of time for this. Yes. Go ahead. Ask. Sir, here's a game of hex. You said that the principal book of the black, the white can steal it and then follow it. So it can be done other way also. Black can steal the white book and follow it as, like, hide the first step and follow it as the second step. Uh, uh, it's a good question, but that logic will not work. Let me try to explain this to you. Let me see if I'm getting you right. You're saying, why can't it be done the other way around? That uh, let us suppose that black, we are going to, the theorem is that black can win. The way you would prove that theorem is assume white can win, and you then precipitate a contradiction. You're just flipping the logic over. Suppose white can win, and there's a book written on how to win. Black is going to cheat by using that book. Exactly, I've reversed it. There's one problem with black using white's book. White can use black's book, but black using white's book has one problem. The first move is done by the other player. So if that place is blocked, you're using a book which pretends that that does not exist. You can't use that book. Whereas, if you're the first player, you can place a stone somewhere and say, mentally, I think it does not exist. If the other person has placed the stone there, you can mentally uh, remove it. So if, if the logic will not go the other way around. So the answer to your question is no, but it's a very good question. This is exactly the way you want to think to take these logics further forward. There was another hand somewhere. Yeah, yeah. It's a good question. I wish I was completely certain. No, I don't think Omotoda renamed it. Uh, somehow it came into game theory in a big way, and people referred to it more and more as a coordination game. But even now, when you read papers, occasionally it will be called an assurance game. But more often, it's called a coordination game, but it's exactly the same game with two names. What's your name? Sorry, it sounded as if it's the same topic. What's your name? So my name is Nilakshi. Nilakshi, is there a Daklam? Do you have a, what is that? 
Oh, no. So like Onu and Milakshi, it's assurance and coordination. <laughs> Oh, yeah, gosh, this is, this is amazing. <laughs> uh, anything else, anyone else? Any questions for the students? May I ask if they are sure. children? They are not asking, so I am asking. How can we uh, use game theory to choose careers? So many of them are confused. Yeah. Is there any easy way in which we can do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, no. I mean, uh, th there are for ch uh, choice like career where there's a, not another side that is strategizing against you, so you don't really need game theory for that. Market is there, but the market is not that. Depending on your choice of career, if the market is going to change things, yes. then that's game theory. So career choice and things like that, of course, very important choice, and you want to do rational thinking. But I don't think by using game theory you'll get any special insight. You use intelligence, data, information. But when the other person is, is, uh, is sitting there and thinking what you're thinking, that's when game theory becomes important. And war is a classic situation. Big corporations do that. I'm trying to think what the other corporation is doing. And the other corporation is trying to think what I'm doing. Career choice is, of course, one of the biggest choices you'll uh, face. But several things we must also remember. Don't get overstressed about that. That uh, what is a good choice, what is a wrong choice, you very often discover in retrospect. I'll just tell you my personal story. I, I feel so happy to be a researcher because I've discovered what I enjoy most. When I was finishing my midway through my PhD, I got the World Bank does recruitment for a, a job called the Young Professionals. And I reached the final stage of the interview. So, and the, I was a student then. They flew me to Paris for the final interview. My parents were very excited. The World Bank career means you're set for life. Final interview, I failed. I did not get the job. And really, I feel blessed by that. I feel it would have been a horrible career. Uh, that's a steady job in a big bureaucracy all through my life. That can be fulfilling, depending on your mindset. I discovered research completely by chance. None of my uh, parents, uncles, aunts, anyone was a researcher. Uh, I do think my father was a very good analytical thinker. Geometry, mathematics, he would do as a lawyer, but he would do it very clearly. But for me, that I just feel so lucky. After I didn't get that job and I was supposed to be a lawyer, I gave, I gave that up. For two, three years, I was depressed. I, I, nowadays, I very seldom get depressed, but I, I was really depressed properly for two, three years. I look back and think it's just a lucky blessing. I mean, I did not know that I'll find the career which I enjoy. Having got it, I discovered this is exactly what I enjoy. So you don't know. Life is full of uncertainties. But also, have, I think morality also gives you a strength, an inner strength which really helps in, through ups and downs and choices. So do hard thinking in choice of your career. But you know, who knows in the end what is good, what is bad. So we are navigating an uncertain world. Most of the time it is that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The game of nets, why do we use an hexagonal only? Why not in other shapes? With other shapes, there comes ambiguity of what is your neighbor. Like in hex, there is a one clear, well defined neighbor. Whereas if you have squares, neighbor, uh, there's a corner point also. So, and you know, no one created hex. Intentionally, it was a hexagonal floor on which these mathematicians used to play this game for fun. Then the theorem comes later. It was John Nash realized that the first player can, in principle, always win. And Nash gave that proof, and interestingly enough, this proof was never written down. It was done intuitively, and it's left as folklore. The mathematicians knew the proof, and it's reached us by one person telling, another person, another person telling. This was never written down as a proof. But that's just the history of the game. Uh, Arushi, you are asking something. Arush, Arushi, yeah. Sir, uh, in Satellite's test paradox, if on Tuesday evening I am thinking about when the test, test would take place, so on Friday it's not possible, but Wednesday, Thursday are possibilities. No, um, by logic you know that Wednesday is not possible. Because if it was on Wednesday, you would know on Tuesday. <laughs> by logic you know. So uh, even on Monday, when you're thinking of Tuesday, this is the way you look at it. That Monday evening, you said the exam was not held today. 
By logic, I know it can't be on Friday. By logic, I know it can't be on Thursday either. By logic, I know it can't be on Wednesday either. Therefore, Monday it has not been held. It can't be held on Friday, Thursday, Wednesday. It will be held on Tuesday, but as soon as on Monday you say it will be held on Tuesday, it can't be held on Tuesday. And therefore, I'm not at all surprised you are troubled. This will keep coming back to you when you keep thinking about it. But I, when I first discovered this, I thought I'll solve it properly. I spent a lot of my time trying to solve the surprise test paradox. Then I discovered some 200 papers with people jumbling and saying, what is going on in this law? simple logic? It's very difficult to pin down. Yes. Sir, if any time is not given, like in a week or in a month, then Pardon? if any time is not given, it is just till that survive test will be given. Well, if no time is given, wonderful question. If we are told, well, you have to think of an infinite world. Uh, if it is an endless number of days in the future, okay, uh, the school continues endlessly. There's no final date of school, and the teacher comes and says that. Sometime in the future, you will get a surprise test. Okay, that's what the teacher says. Very good question. There you can get a surprise. Because there is no last date from which you do the, this is called backward induction reason. This reasoning is called backward induction. If you have a final date, you induct backwards from there. If you don't have a final date, you can't do backward induction. I'll tell you why this is so interesting. The name I gave earlier, Ariel Rubinstein, he, in fact, has games which are infinite games and games with a final date and some spectacular differences. Games which are where you don't know where the last date is. The logic changes quite dramatically. You can't use backward induction. Whereas if there's a final date, you can use backward induction. Yeah. Sir, this backward induction, as you said, so if there are infinite number of days, so I'll know that tomorrow the test is not going to take place. And same if I... Uh, How do you know it won't take place tomorrow? It could be tomorrow. But it could be tomorrow. If you're certain it's tomorrow, it can be a surprise. But today, when you're thinking, can it be tomorrow? And you say, well, it can be tomorrow. And the answer is, it can be tomorrow. Uh, what's happening with the real story is, from Friday, you're backward inducting and saying, it can be tomorrow. But here now, you're saying, it can be tomorrow, it can be day after, it can be any day. Then, yes, it can be any day. That is true. And you will get a surprise. It won't, it won't be a total surprise. It's not that you're thinking it's going to happen tomorrow. You think there's some probability. And that some probability can't be ruled out if it's infinite, because you can't backward induct. Yeah. You told about the games like hex. If two supercomputers, like computers are uh, competing against each other, but us normal humans, how can we use the game theory in our own world? There's also a big part of game theoretic literature where these things, the game theory is a huge discipline. There are people who are doing it full time. Partial knowledge game theory, where we are modeling the fact that you can't do perfect reasoning. How will you play these games? So there are analysis of that kind, where, which is what human beings are. We are not perfect machines. And even when you do analysis with perfect machines, which we do, you get some strange results that we know from uh, 1912 when Zermelo proved theorems on this. Yes? Sir, can you play this um, coordination game and some other game uh, more than two players? You have to rewrite and the game, the rules of the game will have to be uh, uh, done up a bit differently. You have to create that game. The way the original story, I mean, Travelers Dilemma, I wrote it. I wrote it as a two player one. When it comes to assurance game and coordination game, there are actually n player versions of that already known in the literature. And in fact, there are philosophers, there is someone called Van der Schraff in America, who is using these games to understand philosophical problems of human coordination. And there they are converting these into n person games and then analyzing them. There are very practical people. There's someone called Scott Barrett, who writes papers for American government for strategizing on um, uh, climate change matters. There also you think of the N countries, not two countries, but N countries, and what will be the strategy. So these are extensions that can be done. I should stop in another two minutes, and I'll have to take a brief call after that. Game theory can huh? be applied in all sorts of, uh, like demoralization. Could they have uh, applied game theory? 
you know, uh, the demonetization, I, I do think it was a very bad policy. Um, and you don't even need really game theory for that. I mean, any economist you talk to who's, uh, when you uh, talk in a small group, they will say it was not a move that should have been done. And so you don't really need game theory for that. And the government of India itself put out a list of countries that have done similar demonetization. And the list shows that it's a very, it's a, North Korea had done once, uh, Venezuela had done once. It's not a cluster that you want to go into. Suddenly telling people that your currency is not valid. And in the end, it should have been predictable that you will not be able to collect the black money out of that. So, so I, all these past experiences showed that it didn't work. It didn't work. And that was predictable. Yeah. Well, it was done that time. I don't know the details. I mean, Raghuram Rajan had just left as governor. And Urjit Patel had come in. But Urjit Patel also would never have approved it. He had just come in. The policy was virtually done, so it went through. Yeah. I think so. You know, many of these things, I'm right now writing a book. I'll be very happy to share with you all on absolute everyday life. These little bits of logic that come in. I'll tell you one uh, little game theory I had used some 30 years ago before I began working on this for visiting temples. When we go to temples, we have to take your footwear off. I wrote this. Uh, I used to use one game theoretic technique not to lose my choti or shoes. Uh, in the olden days, there would be no monitoring over there. You just leave your footwear and go into the temple. You come out and if you're wearing, especially if you're wearing nice sandals, the chances both will be gone. I started using a technique myself. Then I told all my relatives they were using. Then I published a newspaper article, which, yeah, which, which actually, the, that was my first newspaper article that was widely read. I used to do this in any temple. Go and take off one footwear near one door, walk over to another door, take off the other footwear there. And I'm relying on the rationality of thieves that they will come, they'll have to do it quick. They can't go searching. So, and uh, you go into the uh, uh, temple, you sit peacefully, don't have to worry about your footwear, you will find them invariably. All my relatives had started using this technique. Then I wrote a newspaper article saying how not to lose your footwear. That is a use of little game theory because I'm using the thieves' rationality. That it has to be a quick job. You want the pair to find quickly. And I was using that. This is a trivial example. But it can be used very widely in many situations. Yeah? Sir, if the thief reads the newspaper, then he will know that they will take it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant thing. So, if the, I was relying on the fact that the thieves don't read newspapers. But if this becomes common knowledge, then of course it's very easy. A thief will pick up one and immediately go running to the other and to the Absolutely. So, maybe you want a second that benefit of the At least from uh, after two days, because it will be broadcast on the YouTube. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Again. Yeah. Yes, yes. Let me take. Thank you, sir. Is that uh, you told us about the book, and there it was written about the game theories between the U.S. and Russia. What is that book? Uh, the U.S. and Russia. That is the uh, tape yeah, secret, yeah. secret. Yeah. yeah. Uh, May and Zeliko. <laughs> it's called something like the Kennedy tapes, I'm forgetting. You know, America has a law. When the president does secret recording in Oval Office for 35 years, that can't be made public. So Cuban Missile Crisis was in 1992. This book came out in 19, 1962. What am I saying? 1962. The book came out in 1997. As soon as the 35-year period was over, the book was published. And the book is actually very interesting to read. And there's also a lot of comfort when you read the book is how human intelligence can be so different. That's a comfort. I mean, if you have one kind of advantage, don't have another. Uh, even the speeches, because they don't know they are. Kennedy knew, of course, Kennedy, it's being recorded. And it's believed he told his brother, Robert Kennedy, 
So maybe only two of them knew it was being recorded, others did not know. Kennedy is a very intelligent person, but not a good speaker. His sentences are cutting off, half sentences being left, that's the way Kennedy speaks. Uh, there's uh, uh, McNamara, amazing speaker. For uh, two pages, you're reading McNamara speaking as if he's reading out of notes, twisted in this discussion. And you're seeing game theory being played out, the strategies on being worked out, and then they decide that Kennedy will make a sudden announcement. We do know that over here, a tribute has to go to Russia as well, Khrushchev. Just to complete the story, it is often treated as American victory. Without war, so it's the best kind of victory. You make an aggressive move, suddenly the other side backs down. One secret deal had been cut during these five days. America had earlier placed missiles in Turkey, in that Russia. Khrushchev cut a deal secretly that you will have to remove those as well. And Kennedy demanded something from Khrushchev, saying that America's pride will be hurt if we openly say we have retreated. So we will not openly say that we have retreated, but we will retreat. Khrushchev said, OK, fine, I'm willing to take that, that it will be treated as America's aggressive move. So both sides over here, it was, they put in some of their, and Russia did get a lot out of it, because the uh, uh, American missiles were also removed out of Turkey, and Russia removed the missiles out of Cuba. It was a continuation of the Cold War. And earlier, you know, Fidel Castro, when he first comes to power, he's a popular figure, even in America. He came to Harvard, audience full. Then America's relationship started going bitter. And over here, I have no sympathy with America. Uh, it is a small country, and America was strangling it. Russia was coming in, but then when it became a nuclear war situation, of course, at all costs, you want to douse that. But it's a part of the Cold War. OK, we better. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.